Thank you both for giving your time for this session. Hi, Talia. Hi, Tosi. How, how was the meeting? <laughs> we have an outcome, I'll tell you <laughs> later. Good. That, that was our objective. Not, not the most desired, but yeah. Hmm? Really? <laughs> to, to, to say you are, you are a star, I think. <laughs> Sorry? You are a star, I said, because there's a lot of interest in this whole equation. <laughs> Hi, good evening. I trust all of you can hear me. Great. Um, I'm Niroshi Sirivancha. So on behalf of the Institute of Chartered Accountants of Sri Lanka, I would like to welcome you all to today's webinar, Ports, uh, Colombo Port City and the Skill Requirement, uh, a webinar organized by CA Sri Lanka CPD unit. Um, so we, uh, we have two guest speakers for this uh, session this morning. Both are prominent roles in the Colombo Port City project. Um, I will introduce the first speaker first, Mr. Tulsi Alvihare. He is the Assistant Managing Director of Czech Port City Colombo Private Limited, the largest public-private partnership in Sri Lanka to date. He's a reputed business strategist and a financial advisor with international work experience in London, Melbourne, and Colombo. Mr. Alvihare was a member of the Colombo International Financial Center steering committee task force and the head of mergers and acquisitions at PwC Sri Lanka and Maldives. And he is currently serving as a non-executive independent director of Abans Finance PLC and XPAC Corrugated Cartons PLC. And our second speaker for today is Mr. Salia Vikramasurya. He's um, an appointed member of the Colombo Port City Economic Commission from May 2021, acting as its Director General. He was the Chairman of the Sri Lanka Ports Authority, General Di uh, Director General of the Petroleum Resources Development Secretariat, and he was appointed as Chairman Director General of the Sri Lanka Board of Investment. And he has been the co-chair of the Energy Committee of the Ceylon Chamber of Commerce since 2017. Mr. Vikramasurya is also the chairman of the Petroleum Development Authority of Sri Lanka and newly created upstream petroleum regulator. And our moderator for this evening is Mr. Manuel Jai Singh. Huh? He's the Immediate past president of the Institute of Chartered Accountants of Sri Lanka. He, Mr. Jai Singer, serves as the country managing partner at Ernst & Young Sri Lanka and Maldives, head of assurance in charge of banking and finance services, practice and counting for over 38 years of extensive experience. So for the participants, we have allocated a uh, time towards the end for the questions for you all. So please type your questions on the Q&A section or else the chat option for the convenience of the speakers and the moderator. So without further delay, I would like to invite Mr. Tulsi Alvehare to take over. Over to you, Mr. Alvehare. Hi, uh, thank you. Good evening, everyone. Uh, Hi, Manil, Salia, uh, and thank you, CA Sri Lanka, for inviting me. I have been on a few webinars, I think, for CA Sri Lanka uh, before. And by now, all of you would have heard about the project many times over. So I'm not going to really bore you uh, by repeating the same information that I may have presented to you. So really, I was really hoping that uh, this is going to be uh, very much more interactive and uh, you know there'll be a lot of opportunity to probably uh, 
answer any questions that you all may have. I can see 217 participants uh, may have because there's a lot of misconception. So I'll be happy to answer any questions. Uh, I don't have a presentation, but let me kind of give you a, a quick brief as to where Port City is. And I guess intention of this webinar is more internal CS Sri Lanka for Sri Lankans to really understand the challenges. What Manil was saying is, look, everybody is really waiting to see uh, what is going to transpire from Port City. Uh, what Port City is not is a solution to all problems of our country. I can tell you that. So, uh, so let me kick start by saying that we commenced this journey way back in 2013. Uh, project went through a suspension, as you all know, but we have completed all the infrastructure development and we have invested over $1.2 billion of foreign direct investment so far. Uh, the objective of the investment is really to create 74 marketable plots, uh, varying from mixed use, residential, commercial, hotels, theme park and integrated resort, beach villa, you know, combination of many such uh, land lots, where now we need to really position Port City Colombo to attract the required investment. Now, this is a challenging period, as uh, all of you would agree. The question is, given the country's macro situation, how do we now really embark on this journey? Timing is certainly not great. Now, what we need, so as we speak now, close to over 100 hectares of land is now ready to be monetized. There is also a misconception that we, as the project company of the Port City, is also going to undertake or embark on vertical development. That's not the case. Our prerogative is was to really make an investment, or we have made a commitment to make an investment of $1.4 billion to create land, which was see before, create all the required utilities, infrastructure, landscaping, parks, public spaces, create almost a, 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 a mini city of 2.7 square kilometers, and hopefully to, to position competitively to attract FDIs, so that the, 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 the investors will buy this plot of land from us in return for the investment we made, then they will develop uh, or build according to an agreed master plan. Now we are in this second phase of development. Thus far on the positive side, we have managed to secure uh, investments, fully full investments for the whole of the marina. Uh, that's about, uh, four plots in the marina. That's what you see on the, on the master plan of Port City, like the hook just in front of the presidential secretariat. And there's a marina hotel adjoining that. Those investments are fully secured. And next to that is the, the first landmark Colombo International Financial Center development, which we are partnering with Brown's investment to develop. And we hope to break ground on that quite soon. The investment on our partnership there is about $450 million. The thinking there was that beyond the horizontal development to create the land and the infrastructure, to kickstart things, we have to instill confidence and we kind of made a further commitment to make a billion dollar investment. And this is the phase one of that. Uh, now, we need to then ask ourselves, we need to attract FDIs to, to Port City, right? Uh, to put up office towers, 
put up hotel, hotels, put up apartments, theme parks, right? Then you need to ask yourself, what would you need or what is the prerequisite or what is the need to drive that demand? Fundamentally, Port City needs to appeal as a destination for businesses for it to be successful. I will tell you why. Unless we create a vibrant business district, even residential assets would struggle to attract demand. Now, the objective is to promote trade and commerce within Port City. We would, we would like, we would want multinational companies to come and set up here. If we are able to attract such global brands to come and set up in Port City, naturally demand for housing will rise to cater to accommodate for the expat and, and their staff and families. Now, foreigners will buy residents in Port City typically only as a, an investment property. Which means that it should yield a higher return compared to a competing destination. And I can tell you that there are plenty of those. And more recently, uh, I would say during this pandemic period, even advanced economies like Singapore or Dubai have made very progressive uh, regulation to really try and attract talent and capital. The question is, how do we kind of, where, where does Colombo Port City sit in that equation? See, um, so Colombo, in that sense, is still lagging behind uh, to compete with some of these international cities. Because for you to have a better yield on your investment, uh, either you need to have your residences within that uh, vibrant central business district or joining that. So either the Port City can be a pure uh, waterfront residential offering. If the Colombo is positioned well as a futuristic, vibrant, competitive international city. However, that is not the case for many reasons, as you would know. So the objective of setting up Port City was to really create uh, an extension of the existing CBD to create a real vibrant business international city along with the, the quality of life attributes, if I might say, that Sri Lanka can offer. So that is why for us now it is important or it was a important attribute that uh, the hardware, which was the infrastructure that is already built there that you can see, needed to be augmented by the, the software, which is progressive business friendly laws regulations that could really either differentiate or complement some of the other cities. Uh, so some of the businesses can either relocate or set up uh, in Port City. So the biggest challenge now uh, for us, obviously, and the commission Salia will add later, is that we need to create a destination appeal for businesses to set up in Port City. The first step towards it was the enactment of the Port City 
Economic Commission Act of 2021. That's a quite a progressive piece of legislation. However, it's only a framework. Now, for that law to be operationalized, uh, to put it in action, you need further regulations. Now, what we are doing now at the moment, supporting the, the commission in terms of obtaining feedback from large multinational companies in identified sectors. So we have identified five key sectors that we believe will drive demand in Port City. And we have appointed one of the top global strategy consultants to reach out to these global brands in these sectors and really to identify what is their ask you know, in their next or in their decision making in terms of an expansion or relocation, would they consider Colombo, Port City as a destination? And if they were to consider what is their wish list? The advantage here is that we have a clean slate. You know, the, as a country, now the commission has a clean slate where they can really, they have the powers, the commission has the powers to draft regulations to suit the demands, you know, the current demands. So in that process, it is so important that this regulation drafting is more market driven. So hence, with the assistance of these global uh, strategic consultants, uh, which they have concluded that study, uh, and, I, and, and they will make a presentation to the commission uh, next week, giving that feedback, the market feedback. What I can tell you, I will kind of give you a, a, a kind of a sneak uh, view of what those responses were. Uh, the responses, in the IT sector, uh, the maritime sector, professional services, including uh, regional headquarters has been quite encouraging. IT sector stand out the most as the most appealing sector for many companies. On the financial services uh, sector, yes, the, the location advantage and few other advantages were there, but obviously, when you talk about the financial services sector, we have to kind of take a more holistic view, uh, meaning uh, in congruence of the financial services or the systems of outside Port City in Sri Lanka is also uh, considered. So the responses from some of the international banks have been that look, they wanted to kind of wait and see how the regulations look before they make a decision. The, the most challenging, uh, I would say, questions we have uh, at the moment by many businesses, including banks, is how does Port City insulate itself or not? Or what is the impact? of the larger macroeconomic challenges of Sri Lanka on Port City. Will Sri Lanka default on its debt obligation and hence what would be the impact on Port City? So these are, have been most certainly uh, challenging times for the country, no doubt. And we are trying to uh, sell a, a, a massive asset and a story. Uh, so it is important at this juncture that the regulation drafting happens taking into consideration the, 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 the market feedback and 
and the story that the port city is insulated really uh, from largely from uh, rest of sri lanka because it is an offshore destination from a perspective of uh, currency of transaction is any designated foreign currency other than sri lankan rupees uh, for the real estate demand in port city it is not uh, dependent on local demand the positioning as a destination to do business we are really looking at multinational companies to utilize port city to do business elsewhere so considering some of these probably you know this hypothesis is yet to be tested so i might qualify this yet to be tested uh, so strategic consultants are working with us to kind of test this to see to what extent we can kind of insulate port city from larger macro economic challenges that sri lanka is facing so that we can attract not only equity capital we should be able to attract uh, or raise debt at a reasonable cost if we are to put up the the vertical development or the infrastructure requirement in in port city it, it's it's definitely a, a key challenge at the moment Uh, raising debt finance with the country's credit rating. Uh, so these are some of the challenges. But um, we are optimistic. Hence, we have kind of made a, a further a, a billion uh, dollar investment. And what we have is, as all of you may know, Port City is a twenty-five year project. We have a a more shorter uh, a five year plan. where we have identified 22 plots within port city about 65 hectares with an investment about 5.6 billion is required to kind of build that and we hope that we we should be able to complete that uh, that plan for the next uh, in the next 5 years and so that's the the real objective and some of the assets have been earmarked to break ground this year uh, you will witness that uh, there's a construction happening or ongoing at the moment on site that's the first downtown duty free mall which will be operational in the second quarter so some activity is most definitely taking place in this challenging environment but i must again emphasize that how we navigate the next 12 months where the regulation drafting will come to life on various aspects and once we kind of test that with the market and see the buy in that will really uh, give us a sense as to how fast or how best we are placed to attract the the required uh, demand um i'll be happy to take any questions during the uh, q&a session and i guess that's a, a, a kind of a brief and uh, and 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 some of the challenges that 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 we are currently facing i didn't i didn't um, expect this to be an investor pitch hence if it was an investor pitch tone of my pitch would be completely different i wanted to kind of be very candid uh, because it's a, a ca sri lanka more of an internal discussion and i hope there's no media on the the on this panel i think i check <laughs> we don't think so no it's our ca members uh, thank you very much for that detailed uh, version of the port city now we would like to invite salia uh to uh, uh, talk about uh, the the his session and then we will take a question soon after that thank you thank you very much and uh, thank you tosi um, for that broad overview and thanks to the ca for 
inviting me to represent the Commission on this discussion. Allow me to pick up where Tulsi left off and give you a slightly different perspective of the challenges, because the challenges at this point outweigh the opportunities. But before we, before we get there, I too will preface the discussion by saying that uh, in view of the audience uh, and the nature of the discussion, we won't be visiting any of the narratives that are out there. There are multiple narratives. Only one of them is actually true. Uh, so we just leave all the geopolitics outside and restrict ourselves to a simple discussion of facts as they stand in the context of the project. So first of all, representing the commission, I think it might be useful to shed a little light on what the Commission Act also referred to actually is. It's a new piece of legislation and it gives ownership of the area of authority, which is the Port City Project, to the commission actually. So the government owns the property in, on freehold terms uh, through the commission and the commission is empowered to set rules uh, Apply, applicable to different sectors and the management of different services and facilities within the community. It's uh, quite simple. So it's a little separate on cloud, if you like. Uh, the act has not many objectives. So I, I think it's worthwhile for you to hear what the objectives of the commission are in terms of the act. So that also will underline some things that Tosi mentioned uh, about being the silver bullet. Uh, I don't think it's a silver bullet for Sri Lanka, but certainly over the long term, there is uh, some excellent opportunity for it to be an economic catalyst of uh, substantial proportions. So here we go, objectives of the commission. Enhanced, attract enhanced foreign direct investment. So that's, uh, that's clearly out there. That's one of the roles of this, this project. And by definition, foreign is international, and we certainly interpret international to be international and cosmopolitan from different countries and different places of the world. Number two, create a safe and conducive business environment and facilitate ease of doing business. So that means the Commission needs to pay attention to leverage the opportunities offered by this uh, fantastic physical infrastructure to actually uh, make, the, make things easier to happen for people, both living here as well as um, doing business here. Uh, it also talks about encouraging, promoting global and regional investments in trade, shipping, and a whole bunch of other sectors here, which I'll leave you to read. But specifically, logistics operations, uh, bank, offshore banking, finance, technology, business process, outsourcing, corporate headquarters, I'm reading from the Act, and uh, regional distribution operators, tourism, and other ancillary services are mentioned. Promote and develop innovation and entrepreneurship. That's an important thing because it impinges on how we manage data and uh, data. Uh, proposed data and data protection and so on and so forth. Um, generate employment opportunities. That's an objective of the commission. Promote sustainable development and promote urban amenity operations. And those last two things are easy to say, but very difficult to define and they will constitute one of our key differentiators. Uh, sustainability is uh, is, is how, how friendly we are in terms of uh, recognizing the challenges to the earth in terms of environment, climate, carbon neutrality, net to zero water. Sorry. Um, and other aspects that impinge our life and uh, in a society. And uh, amenity operations also includes things like access for people with different levels of ability and so on and so forth. So there's a, a lot of thinking that has to go into making this city, a city comfortable, the future city, a city comfortable for people to live in of all, of all kinds, uh, as it were. So here we are. And none of these things directly relates to increasing revenue or has direct 
direct impact on uh, sovereign liquidity or reserves or anything like that, at least over the short term. Mm -hmm. Now, another aspect of how this project works, it's quite important that we understand what we can do and what we can't do from the commission's point of view. The act is very broad. It's very, how can I say, it's, uh, it's very, um, it, it, the act allows for a lot of flexibility and as Tulsi mentioned, the power to be exercised to regulate certain sectors, but it's a responsibility that actually is exercised through uh, areas of authority other than the commission. So it's the act that's powerful, not the commission, because the commission needs to operate through the president and the president in most cases needs the conference of cabinet for a, a, almost everything ranging from defining what the business of strategic importance could be, what exemptions and incentives could be granted. So the committee has independent, the commission has independent discretion to simply classify a party as an authorized person. Anything more than that requires a deeper level of engagement. And as a result, it requires the commission to be quite responsible in its recommendations to the president and cabinet. Now, the act itself has two schedules at the back of it. I'll start with schedule three. Schedule three defines seven statutes, and these are the Urban Development Authority Act, the Municipal Council Ordinance, the Commercial Mediation Center, the Town and Country Planning Ordinance, the Strategic Development Projects Act, the Public Contracts Act, and the Board of Investment Law. Now, these seven statutes do not apply within the jurisdiction of the area of authority of the commission. So they, they actually do not apply. They're not there. Then I'm going to read out very quickly 13 uh, statutes or oh, enactments under which exemptions or incentives may be granted by the commission. Now, as I mentioned before, the commission doesn't have the power to exempt or incentivize on its own. It needs to do this by the offices of His Excellency the President and the Cabinet of Ministers which in some instances specify ministries such as the Ministry of Finance and in some cases the Monetary Board. These are the Indian Revenue Act, the Value Added Tax Act, the Finance Act number 11, number 5, the Excise Special Provisions Act, the Customs Ordinance, the Ports and Airport Development Levy, the Sri Lanka Export Development Act, the Betting and Gaming Levy Act, the Termination of Employment of Workmen Act, the Entertainment Tax Ordinance, the Foreign Exchange Act, and the Casino Business Regulations Act. So I, I took you through that, uh, ladies and gentlemen, simply to explain to you that there is a framework within which the Commission operates. Certain laws that are otherwise applicable do not apply. Certain laws that are applicable apply with uh, flexibility for the Commission to grant, grant incentives and exemptions through the offices I mentioned. The rest of it, unless uh, superseded by regulations specifically uh, uh, promulgated by the Commission to achieve a particular purpose in a particular sector uh, is a normal law, are the normal laws of the country. I hope that gives you a broad framework of what the Commission can do and can't do and how it does what it has to do, which is to meet the objectives as I read out to you earlier and do our best to merge the requirements of, of the nation with the mandate of the act and also the investors requirements from the kind of population globally that we're looking to attract into the port city. Uh, in order to do this, <coughs> the Tulsi's team, the project company has done a lot of work in reaching out to different parts of the world in different areas, studying competitive benchmarking, um, uh, studying different zones and competitively benchmarking them for the commission or rather the, even before the commission was started. That work had been started so that the project could then be marketed when the project actually came to market. Now, as he said, about 40-45% of the plots are actually ready to be marketed. They have been technically certified as complete. Now, the commission doesn't automatically take on board uh, these recommendations uh, simply because times have also moved on and 
aspirations have changed and the act defines a slightly different flavor of operations than might have been envisaged before. So the commission broke it up into three things, uh, looked at the non-fiscal policies and processes. So in other words, we're looking at business process improvement and lifestyle management, community management and so on and so forth, all of the policies and processes. And then we look at the fiscals. What's the fiscal regime? What's the fiscal model? Are there what taxes, what charges, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then the last thing is we, we looked at um, how can we can actually align with the needs of specific key investors and secure some anchor investors into the board. And the commission accordingly went to the market uh, a few months ago with the uh, so, uh, support and assistance from the project company. And these three pieces of work, that's non-fiscal competitiveness, fiscal competitiveness, and specific population or populating of anchor tenants has now been awarded to some of our leading firms uh, in Sri Lanka and work is progressing. So all of the work that has been done prior to this, this exercise by the project company will be channeled into these companies and under those three pillars, they will be analyzed, updated, gaps identified, swatted and sent back to the commission. Now, all of this sounds very laborious and boring, but it is quite important that we exercise our mandate responsibly and above all, make sure that the objectives of the project are met. And you, you heard them, the, the first five or six things I said. Now, in that respect, I have a couple of very quick points to make. Uh, I'd like to dig deeper into a word that Tulsi used, which is insulation. Insulated. So let's start by being very clear that there is no physical border between the port city and the city of Colombo or Sri Lanka. It is one territory and there is free movement of people without uh, checks or, or censure or any kind of passage restriction in either direction. This, of course, has implications because your laws and policies and regulations, which ultimately, so your, your laws and policy, your, your policies and processes, which ultimately must be captured by regulation, should be defined in such a way as to not discriminate between Sri Lankans and not discriminate between residents and investors in the port city. So there's a, a fine balancing act there. So insulation is not physical. Insulation is legal. There needs to be some insulation. And insulation, insulation against what? We would not need to insulate against anything if there wasn't a fair high degree of per perceived country risk. So that, that perceived country risk, uh, I don't think anymore is, is geopolitical as such. Uh, the, the, the conflict days are over and our government is stable. Having said that, there is legal risk, there is financial risk, uh, fiscal risk in that sense, uh, and there's reputational risk. And there's the risk of being physically connected in other senses rather than access. Now, access is not restricted. But take, for example, we have an island-wide power cut potentially happening on Monday. It keeps getting put off, but it may happen one of these days and it may continue to happen. Now, those power cuts can't happen in the port city. So even at this very stage, we need to have a view, an eye, on how do we actually provide this insulation in terms of business processes that are happening there, people who are living there, uh, tourists shopping there. So we, we, we have invested a fair amount of new energy into ensuring that failure modes are limited and there is always a backup for something so that the customer experience is seamless. Because we are focusing on a few things for the customer and the customer could be a resident, the customer could be a business. Uh, we are focusing on unlocking financial value. There is no point in having a place in a, in a, in a city in, as nice as Colombo, in a country as beautiful as Sri Lanka, as well located as we are in the world, without actually having some financial benefit. Uh, so that. Um, we need to be flexible in our approach. 
we need to provide investors by flexible. I mean, we need to be accommodating and not bureaucratic. Uh, we, we, uh, we need term visas, visas for their families. The renewal process must be seamless. The associated uh, permitting and applications and so on and so forth should be seamless and for that. The Act has given us a broad mandate uh, under what is known as the single window facilitation mandate that is covered by section 30. And we need to have uh, very range of things that need to complement the safety and security. So I think with that view, perhaps it's enough for me to stop there to take questions. These are the challenges in front of us. Uh, as uh, Tulsi mentioned earlier, we are in the process of stage by stage, priority by priority, moving into different sectors and promulgating regulations under them. The, my last comment here at this stage would be that the commission has recommended certain categories of activities to be classified already as businesses of strategic importance. And some of them, because of their importance to the project, to be classified as being exempted from uh, all the fiscal burdens to the fullest extent of the, the project. And these sectors are the, the actual physical development, the physical infrastructure building of the 74 plots, banking and financial services, uh, exchanges of all kinds, stock, commodity, digital assets. Uh, we would like to see the duty-free mall that is a regional first take off and be very successful. So there are certain sectors, knowledge process outsourcing, business process, uh, software development, creative, IP, IP, the innovation part of the mandate of the commission, we are encouraging as a business of strategic importance. Some of these things can be done while the commission is existing, but the project is not. The project will take time to come. My last point here, in, especially in this audience, is to say that the commission does not uh, envisage the Port City project uh, or any of the area of authority to be a tax haven. And the taxes will apply to, tax, to business that are not strategically important. And it is not by any means an address by which you can domicile yourself and be exempt from the taxes that might apply uh, to you under normal circumstances. So we're not a PO box. Um, I'll stop there and hand over back to Manuel for questions. Uh, thank you, uh, Tanya and uh, Tulsi for that uh, <clears throat> presentation on the different aspects of the Port City. Um, I, I think we, this whole equation is a very interesting uh, concept for Sri Lanka. And uh, as you explained, uh, there are certain, uh, how should I say, uh, myths about it. And I, I think some of them you have you addressed, uh, the two of you are, between the two of you, you have addressed uh, uh, some of these because there is this whole equation that uh, people think that uh, Port City will be uh, like a new region, which is not. It, it, by and large, will come within the purview of the laws and regulations within the country, except for uh, the ones that you mentioned, uh, which is coming, that is the seven statutes and 13 uh, statutes where you are permitted to give uh, certain exemptions and incentives. Uh, so that was, I think, a very uh, useful uh, uh, overview uh, of the whole project. Um, so from our members' side, I think uh, uh, what we were interested to see is how our profession and the members can, can contribute to this whole equation. Apart from the, the marketing side, uh, clearly uh, you all will uh, handle and maybe some of our members might get uh, interested in the marketing side as well. But it was more towards the types of businesses that are likely to come in what opportunities that our members will have for those types of businesses and whether maybe uh, whether we need to rescale some of our members to uh, probably equip them to handle 
uh, the types of businesses that are likely to come. So th those were the sort of the areas that we were really looking. So if I may first, uh, there were some questions that came through. Maybe we can take those uh, up front and then uh, create a discussion and then maybe uh, I will, and then hopefully questions will keep coming and maybe we can uh, address some of the other issues as well. So this is one of the questions uh, I think you might be able to see. It, it says that if we want to work with you as a consultant or representative to promote the Port City business opportunities, are you assigning us with proper agreements to work with foreign parties outside Sri Lanka? That is one of the questions. I'm not too sure whether Tulsi is going to tackle it or Salia or maybe both. I can I can take the question, uh, Anil. Yes, so, what 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 we have, as you know, the type of type and size, and the profile of the investment we are looking at Port City is quite large. So anything beyond at least a hundred million dollars is required for you to kind of make a start in Port City. So that kind of gives you the profile of the investment that we are looking at. So the approach we are taking at the moment, we have what is called certain agency or promotional agreements that we have signed with large multinational consulting companies who has a proven track record in bringing in investment. And this is predominantly a success fee-based uh, arrangement. Yeah. Is shy away from signing any uh, consultancy agreements with an individual, unless otherwise, obviously, there's merit in it. Uh, but in order to kind of promote everybody, including staff, to really have a conversation about Port City, to try to promote, what you're saying is, look, if you have some discussions with a, a particular investor, local or foreign, uh, and if there is some traction, please introduce uh, to us. And if you feel that that discussion is going to transpire into uh, an investment, then we can formalize uh, uh, an agreement with that part. So that's the approach we have taken. Because what is important uh, is just to qualify is also, you know, there are many brokers out there without a real mandate uh, trying to sell the Port City story and, and I'm afraid they dilute the proposition. Because it's important to kind of give the facts right. So to avoid that, at the moment we have only gone with uh, international agencies who has the proven track record. Thanks, Tulsi. Uh, I'll come back to you on a different uh, question, but the next question, I think this was uh, sort of uh, uh, addressed by Salia to some extent, so maybe Salia can answer this as well. So it says that how will the present power crisis uh, going to affect the companies that will start operations when it, when it, is, when it is ready? Will you have a separate power supply system or we do depend on uh, Ceylon electricity board. Uh, Sali just touched on this, maybe he can elaborate this a little bit uh, more because this will also go to the, the attractiveness of uh, businesses setting up in the port city as opposed to setting up in, in uh, other parts of the country. Uh, thank you, Manil. It is a very important question. And the answer is very simply that power and other shortages cannot and simply must not be allowed to impact the port city. It would destroy the proposition of a future-proof, sustainable, access-friendly, pedestrian, modern, smart city if all of a sudden the traffic lights don't work because the CB shuts the grid down. So that's it's a non-starter. Therefore, the commission's view is that those those uh, you know th those those fl flaws or those uh, if you like those uh, uh, vulnerabilities need to be ironed out at this stage 
So we have communicated a few things to, to the utility providers uh, on things like uh, water management and power management. And one of the things we have actually communicated, which is relating to this and potentially might be one of the solutions is that uh, the Port City investor profile that Tulsi described elevated global corporates and uh, individuals of some substance typically have certain requirements uh, of their own. Now, corporates, uh, some corporates will not invest in an area that doesn't have um, a carbon neutrality target by 2050, or, it, or, for, or for that matter, it doesn't have renewable energy. So we have indicated to the Sinan Electricity Board that the port city must be furnished with 100% renewable energy. Now, how we're going to do that, it's a, it's a collective challenge, but it also, it, imp it has several implications and it has several means of being met. So if the country is behind the project and supporting the project and understands that that aspiration is genuine and necessary, then the country will allow power wheeling and peer-to-peer -peer power purchase agreements so that there can be some system of redundancy built in to utilities. I hope that gives you some answer. It does, not, yeah. So the issue, the challenge, I think, uh, I'm sure you are the commission also uh, are grappling with this, uh, how this can be, how should I say, containerized uh, to show that, okay, the first thing is that you are going to have to identify certain, uh, how should I say, deal-breaking type of uh, uh, utilities that needs to be there for the success of the port city. Uh, power is one, you said water management, and things like that. The next issue is then there are certain conditions that the investors are bringing in, as you mentioned about carbon neutrality and all that. Now, since it's a provider of service to the whole island, how would you how do you think that that segmentation will occur to say that to the port city you will have a certain degree of carbon neutrality, the rest of the country uh, it's the same provider, right? Well, it doesn't have the same provider, Manil. It doesn't have, okay. that's the whole point. Because if we are restricting ourselves to the current ways of doing business, then we are giving ourselves a glass ceiling we don't need. So from that standpoint, the commission doesn't have any feeling that this should be done by the CEB or the water board or anything like that. The, the okay. optimum solution will be designed and we have today had uh, the second in a series of uh, detailed workshops that are a combination of team from the ports, from the project company and a team from the commission digging detail into the details of how to engineer this into the design okay. and what kind of service provider would fit the bill for the project objectives we cannot let the project objectives and success be hijacked by limitations we currently suffer okay so that that sort of uh, this is again my limited knowledge of uh, the, the the laws uh, the issue there is there would have to be certain amendment brought into the legal system also then because currently there are restrictions about who can provide power and if you do provide power you have to provide power to the CEB and not directly to any other uh, operation and things like that uh, so th those probably need some amendments in order for you to facilitate the model that you're probably thinking on uh, okay so, so anyway, I think the commission is uh, on the ball. <laughs> so they, they probably will have to get that because those are, I, I do agree, they are deal breaker type of, uh, deal breaker type of uh, uh, situation where if you don't get those things right, you will not be able to attract the, uh, the, the right type of investor, I, I believe. Uh, there is uh, the, the, okay, the other question they're asking is, uh, this whole project, what kind of uh, benefits do you think it can have to, to, to professionals like chartered accountants and uh, uh, people of that nature? So that's a question that has been asked by the audience. How would you sort of uh, respond to that? Uh, in my mind, I have something, but I think good for you to respond. To this. So, Sally or Sally probably not more than two. Oh, I was going to say, Manil, you're, you're very well positioned to answer that question. <laughs> I, I have something, but I'd like to hear your, <laughs> your view. Uh, Tulsi, do you want to go first? I mean, you've been looking at this longer than I have. Yeah, so um, obviously you would have heard um, on the media, then there was an independent PwC 
study was done in terms of what is the direct employment generation of port city. So numbers vary somewhere between 80 to 100,000 direct jobs. Uh, this is once port city is fully operational. Okay, so I mentioned that we have kind of have a, we have a, what is called a five year more shorter term uh, rollout plan. So according to that 22 plot 65 hectare five year rollout plan we have, we have estimated that during construction stage, we would create close to about 50,000 jobs. That 50,000 jobs is split between say about 10% on project management, another 10% percent on unskilled and the rest 80 percent on skill. Once construction is completed, uh, the five sectors that I discussed before, or areas I discussed before, uh, we expect based on the, uh, the, the, the developed area and based on the international standards per employee, etc., we expect a further 20,000 white collar jobs to be created. Of that 20,000, almost closely a lion's share is for IT sector. Close to about 50% of that would go for IT. Rest uh, split between maritime uh, financial uh, services, professional services, as kind of headquarter business. So that's the kind of split that we have. So obviously, accountants, professionals like yourselves will fit in all five sectors, across all five sectors, but within the, the broad parameters of this is the larger numbers that we are looking at in the first five years. Yeah, thank you, Tulsi. Uh, I think uh, that was sort of but I was also aiming at because this all depends on your 22 plots, uh, the, the, uh, which was originally given the types of businesses that you're trying to attract in that uh, first phase. So if there are uh, types of businesses where they are going to have uh, sort of moving of headquarters or whatever it is into the port city, uh, then the back office services like global service delivery centers, uh, those will obviously attract uh, a certain amount of professional and skilled uh, labor. That also depends on the type of uh, global service delivery that will sit in the port city, uh, whether it requires uh, professional input or whether it requires uh, semi-skilled uh, sort of routineness type of jobs. It will it will be high, more higher end, Manil, simply because of the real okay. estate cost. Right. right? So, so that's good good to hear that. So that means there will be more opportunity be more of for KPOs, professionals. KPOs, if at all. Yes. Right. So, so I hope that answers that question. So there is a lot of opportunities uh, from a uh, from a chartered accountant's point of view. Uh, we have about uh, say six thousand members, of which about six hundred are in practice, uh, and there is a good part of them who are not here as well. About thirty percent of that uh, six thousand is not here. So uh, clearly, for the rest of them, there is uh, there is opportunities available coming from the port city. Uh, whether it's a hardcore accounting or whether it is working within a shared service center or whatever it is there will be. Uh, so, so with that, Tursi, what I would like to ask is, would there be anything, uh, obviously, chartered accountants are uh, skilled and they have possess the knowledge and the, the competency to do, I think, uh, work in any part of the world. Uh, because. Currently, as I said, 30% are outside Sri Lanka means obviously they are capable of doing uh, competent work any, anywhere. So the, the issue is, from what I could have seen and what I heard from you, there isn't anything new that is going to come where they need to be newly skilled or whatever it is. Uh, but uh, clearly, I think they will, if, if you are working as the accountant or a CFO or whatever it is in a port city company, you may probably need to understand the environment, the laws and regulations that govern the port city to some extent. Uh, but apart from that, I, I didn't see anything unique or anything specific that you will require. I, I don't know whether you can add something yeah. to that. Uh, may I add something? Uh, after yeah. Tulsi, go ahead. I just want to add yeah, a couple yeah. of points. 
Okay. Um, so one of the real positive feedback we got from the strategy consultant study uh, when they kind of tested this idea about locating to Sri Lanka is the access to the talent pool. Uh, it is well known out there regionally, more so regionally, that there is a, a, a decent IT and accounting professional talent team access in Sri Lanka. So that has become a huge plus point more and over and above the, the tax incentives really. Uh, so that's that's real huge positive. In terms of the additional skills uh, you require, my only observation is that these are going to be global companies uh, who will set up here. Uh, so I understand we also follow SLFRS. So from an accounting standard perspective, I don't think you need to be familiar with or you know upskill much. But as you would know, dynamics of a go global multinational company dealing in different currencies. If you're set up, setting up your headquarter business, can be quite a cumbersome. So skills, I would say more so on the soft skill side. Uh, is something that is really perceived as quite uh, crucial. On the technical uh, side, I would say because uh, Port City is deemed to be an offshore jurisdiction, you will see more and more front-end companies, even Sri Lankan companies who set up their front-end services in Port City whilst the, the back-end manufacturing or routine services will be set up outside Port City in Sri Lanka. So the transfer pricing will kick in when your manufacturing facility in one of the zones, outside zones, will now provide the merchandise to your trading office, buying office in Port City and bill it for it. And then that trading office will obviously, so this is more like existing apparel companies who are set up in Singapore or Hong Kong now, ideally we would want them to now set up in Port City in your own backyard because it is a deemed export. Hmm. Thanks Tulsi. So that, that's, I hope it gives our members uh, reasonable uh, insights into, into uh, what is uh, required of them. But uh, uh, Sally, I think you wanted to uh, you wanted to say something. Sally, Sally, okay. yeah, Sally wanted to say, but he seemed to be just offline. Uh, we will try to get him connected, but in meantime. Uh, so the, the, just to get some uh, feel, uh, Tulsi, now with these 22 plots and, uh, you know, the, the, the types of pieces that you're looking. Okay. Salia? Yeah. Sorry, uh, Salia, uh, uh, you wanted to say something uh, on that uh, question about the talent pool and the uh, skill sets. Yeah. Sorry, uh, uh, everybody, that was a power cut, actually. And that's the kind of thing we must <laughs> never allow to happen uh, sure. ever in the port city. And it takes, it takes five minutes of your time wasted and uh, for the generator to kick in and take the load and the servers to reconnect and the modems to reconnect. So my sincere apologies for that. I just wanted to say I missed what you guys were talking about for the last five minutes. But I wanted to emphasize uh, a point here, which is by the nature of business, we hope to see happening in the port city and from and through the port. Mm. Uh, and uh, the objective of the commission is to, to engineer an internationally cosmopolitan, uh, shall we say, society and put in minimum restrictions in terms of uh, nationality, in terms of uh, you 
uh, all the other potential barriers to to people moving between jobs. Now, people who will be encouraged to come in here and uh, domicile themselves here. But then setting up a company in the port city, which then can also do business with companies outside the port city. Say, if you want to set up an accounting firm in port city, uh, you can continue to service your clients outside of port city. Uh, however, there are some obligations. Uh, you, by becoming an authorized person, you then take on the mantle of a foreign currency denominated employer. Therefore, you need to have foreign currency coming into the accounting firm that you uh, set up and you need to pay your employees in foreign currency. And if, for example, you do a service for a company outside of the port city and you, you earn rupees, those rupees will have to come into an account that is held outside the port city and subject to the normal laws of the country. So there are certain, there are certain catches built into the act that uh, essentially slant us towards the international arena in terms of skilling and talent. Uh, and up, uh, upskilling and, and talent uh, requirements. And many of these things will build over time, but certainly IT and, and uh, financial services and to some extent legal services will be one of the first off the ground. Thank, thank you, uh, Sani, for that. Um, so, so basically uh, what we have is that uh, initially, uh, that the opportunities will be created for IT and uh, IT and accounting and uh, for financial services as well as uh, I think to some extent legal as well as you mentioned. Uh, I think uh, while you were out, uh, so just mentioned that uh, from a from a accounting side of it, we are actually geared to handle uh, international uh, type of transactions because our curriculum is developed on uh, on international accounting uh, as well. But uh, there is some element, uh, two elements I think he mentioned was that uh, the whole issue about, uh, you know, your familiarity in operating in a multi-currency environment, uh, because you'll be dealing with uh, not, not necessarily Sri Lanka rupees, but maybe dollars or any other currency that is there. The, so that the challenges that will come from that, as well as uh, uh, the fact that uh, maybe a lot of soft skills may be necessary because at the end of the day, uh, it's not working for a, a Sri Lankan uh, employer, but it may be a inter multinational or international uh, employer. So th those are the sort of areas that probably we need to take on board and uh, focus a little bit. And um, uh, how, uh, one question I'll ask both of you, Alex, that uh, you know, with the current situation, uh, there is supposed to be somewhat of a talent drain outside the Sri Lankan markets. You know, there is a push. Uh, for example, I've noticed that uh, most younger people are now trying to move overseas, uh, given the current scenario. So to, to what extent do you think it will, uh, your project on Port City will stem that outflow and then retain them uh, technically within the shores of Sri Lanka, but, uh, but not necessarily in the shores of Sri Lanka? Uh, how, how do you sort of see that? I think sincerely, Manil, I'm a huge believer in that. Uh, I'll tell you why. Because simply, you know, I, I think, I, I think if it's almost your, you know, if you manage to attract the likes of the Googles, Amazons, here to Port City, right? You don't, you no longer want to uh, work in Singapore or Hong Kong, or, or you know, there are many Sri Lankans who I know. Given the, if you create the right economic environment, then nobody is willing to take a a 50, 60, 70% uh, haircut on their remuneration uh, just to move back uh, home. But provided that they're compensated economically and still have the ability to work for a multinational company, I think there'll be a lot of Sri Lankans who would want to return and work in Port City. So that depends on how successful we are in trying to attract some of these global brands. In fact, um, on the hospital, there's an international hospital, right? On the hospital project, when we kind of discussed this and tested this idea, mooted this idea, there are many Sri Lankan doctors, surgeons who are overseas 
given there is a, a decent brand, given uh, you know some of these stringent regulations, existing regulations, as be will be taken care of, they're willing to really return. So some of the, uh, the the human resource requirement in Port City will be addressed really, I feel, in three ways. One is the Sri Lankans who are looking to go overseas now will have an opportunity in their backyard. Second is that Sri Lankans who are overseas will now look to come back and work in Port City. And third is obviously uh, foreigners. Thank you, Tulsi. Uh, there's one interesting question. I think Salia is probably the best equipped to ask this. It says, uh, Insulation of the port city from rules, regulations, and laws impede the progress of Sri Lanka is understood. But without physical insulation, can the flow of persons to the port city and goods and services, in particular IT enabled services, be contained to prevent leaks? Yeah, that's a very good question. And uh, we, we debated a lot in the commission. The simple answer to that is yes, uh, by technology and smart planning. So in terms of if you, if you take, for example, uh, if you take, uh, just take, for example, uh, the duty-free mall that, that we're building here, that there's a great fear in Sri Lanka that people can walk in here and buy stuff, and then it leaks out into the local market. So there are two or three ways we are approaching to, to restrict that opportunity. Uh, keeping in mind, Manil, that you don't want to choke 90% of legitimate aspirations for 5 to 10% of, uh, of, shall we say, malintent. Mal um, one is to restrict the amount, the, 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 the product slate, the, the stuff that is sold there should not be duplicating stuff that is sold outside. Uh, that's one, one of the things that is a very simple measure to take. And the other one is when you're talking in terms of selling something duty-free to somebody, that person must have an allowance or an entitlement to buy said thing duty-free. That can be controlled by an amalgamation of uh, uh, software that runs immigration customs and uh, ties it into the port city duty-free operators uh, system and the commission system where you know that party X uh, came in from some and such and such a place has a digital signature or a QR code, which identifies them and only they have access to this particular allowance and they spend it. So, I mean, technology can solve a lot of these problems, but some of it also requires modification. Take licensing of banks, for example. Um, the port city cannot function with, uh, at least with the, with the restrictions that are currently in place on current and capital account movements that apply to uh, uh, banks uh, onshore, it's really a little bit difficult to convince somebody to park their money here. Uh, I'm sure you'll all agree. Uh, that there's a, there's a great risk of, of, of it being actually being restricted in onward movement. Uh, approvals have to be obtained, uh, potentially converted. Um, and there's all sorts of uh, there's all sorts of things that put off a person's wish to bring money into Sri Lanka in a flexible and transparent manner. So, by definition, bankers or businesses or individuals in Port City, they must have free and transparent movement of foreign currency in and out of their account in the Port City. This, of course, this product is not available on land yet because there are restrictions on every kind of account that exist for people opening foreign currency accounts. So therefore, there needs to be uh, two parallel licenses. Uh, license banks have to be licensed to, for the purpose of execution of their business under the Act, the Port City Act, in parallel to the license that allows them to execute their business under the normal laws. So one arm, the, the, the both arms come up to the monetary board at the top but one arm comes under the commission and one arm comes under the CBSL. So that, 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 there are certain segregations that have to happen by organization and planning and uh, without necessarily meeting statutory changes. 
but we, we, we have to create the environment where people can, uh, keep, people can actually manage to do the kind of business they would in Singapore or Dubai in the manner they would in those places here in the port city uh, without being restricted to what restrictions apply on land. One, one other quick point, which I missed uh, to add to what, maybe Tulsi already mentioned this, incentivization of people to come here and retention of talent, being paid in foreign currency is a huge thing because it, uh, it, uh, it uh, not only does it uh, hedge against uh, inflation to a certain extent linked to the rupee, but also it is tax-free. So now, for example, uh, somebody sets up an accounting firm to do business with uh, companies within the port city, inside the port city, that person employs people and pays them in dollars, and that dollars are tax-free. So from that point of view, uh, there are substantial motivations for people to, uh, to, to come in here. Uh, thank you, Sari. Sari, uh, Sari and Tuzi know sort of a lot of things that we discussed today. Uh, there are certain things still in the pipeline since some of these laws have to be addressed, some of these infrastructure stuff has to be uh, uh, sorted out uh, going forward. When do you have in your mind some form of a date or time frame by which these, some of these things will is likely to get resolved, which will give some idea as to when the project itself will, how should I say, get operationalized. Well, I'll start with that and hand over to Tulsi. So there is no, when people can talk to us anytime, even now, and people are and have, and we have approved projects to start. Those that we have approved are projects that we have we have dealt with on a custom basis, bespoke basis. Uh, typically, you know things like a stock exchange, for example, that can operate outside uh, the port city for for a period of years and then move uh, physically back in. So it's 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 um, it's work in progress, Manu, because remember that back in June of 2021, there was only the act. And there were lots of work, there's lots of work that had been done before, but that all has to be compartmentalized into the manner in which, is, which it is now required to be. And it needs to be market tested sometimes again, because things have changed globally. The economy has changed and our own driving pressures have changed. So the things that you will see first are the banking regulations. Uh, and I'm going to hand over to Tulsi later because uh, it's the project company that has done the background work for much of this stuff. The next one, of course, will be the, the, the visas and um, the, the, the softer part of engaging in business in the port city. Uh, the physical infrastructure will have, we have already made recommendations to His Excellency the President. And um, there will be continuing to be certain pockets, certain sectors that regulations will be drawn up fairly quickly. But that's, there's nothing to prevent people from writing to the commission or the project company at any time and ask us questions about how to start doing business. And that, that those questions are welcome. We will, nothing is deferred. We are already doing business. We will support them as best we can. It's just taken us a little time to understand how to get certain things, uh, certain things done. Tulsi, over to you. You know, I mean, it's entirely up to Salia and the commission <laughs> to get the, get the, get the regulations uh, going. Uh, so I, I, I would, so I, I think the advantage here is uh, because you don't have to wait until the physical infrastructure or the vertical development happens, right? There is a, a transition provision in the law that you can do business from outside Port City for the first five years. So once the, the basic things in terms of, uh, you know, setting up of your business, what tax concessions are you entitled to, if you're a regulatory business like a bank, obviously those are in place. I would imagine in the before end of this year, we will get a pulse as to how the demand is like. Because some of these companies who will commit, like let's assume an IT company, Typically, they will start with about 100, right? but they scale it up quite quickly in the five years. So although they will be setting up outside Port City, they'll be entitled to the, the under the Port City law, they will be entitled to whatever the concessions as granted by the commission. 
And once the port city infrastructure is ready, obviously they can move in there. So we are also quite keen to really, by hopefully by end of the year, we will have a better pulse as to where the demand is coming from, what sort of our, uh, businesses are coming in because they would have to give a commitment to the, the commission in order to be entitled for certain concessions on their scale up plan, because you can't expect them to really re out locate outside Port City and start from day one with 100 or 200 employees. So, yeah. Thank you, Tulsi uh, and uh, Salia. Uh, I think uh, our time is sort of uh, run out. Uh, anyway, I am, of course, uh, uh, hopeful that uh, these are all new opportunities and new uh, areas that. Uh, uh, will be available for the country and our members going forward. Uh, you uh, outlined uh, the 22 uh, sort of plots and types of businesses that will come through, so which is a good uh, good uh, start. And hopefully, we will be able to uh, get these laws and uh, whatever is necessary in place as well as fast as possible. And uh, uh, Ching. Uh, at least get this project moving as fast as possible so that uh, it will benefit uh, the country and uh, everyone else uh, in it. So thank you very much uh, to both of you all for that uh, enlightening uh, sort of overview of the Port City and where we are standing and, and, and the progress forward. So I, I hope that uh, it, uh, our members uh, found it uh, useful. And um, so with that, I will... Uh, hand over to uh, Niroshi, who will uh, close the session. Thank you, sir. Um, it was indeed a stimulating discussion. Uh, a big thank you for Mr. Manil Jaisingha, Mr. Tulsi Alubihare, and Mr. Salia Vikramasurya. Uh, for conducting a very interesting and informative webinar uh, with a lot, lot of valuable insights. Uh, so a big thank you for all the participants for joining us on behalf of the Institute of Chartered Accountants of Sri Lanka and on behalf of the CPD committee. Thank you, everyone. Stay safe and good night. Thank you. Thank you, thank you everyone. Likewise. Thank you.